Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. My father always used to focus on the uniqueness of Jesus. He always used to say, Jesus is the only way. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So let us enter through that gate and worship our God this morning. Let us worship. Good morning, everyone. Our call to worship this morning comes from 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 to 24. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it.
we believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. We believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we lower our heads before you and we confess that we have too often forgotten that we are yours. Sometimes we carry on with our lives as if there was no God and we fall short of being a credible witness to you. For these things, we ask for your forgiveness and we also ask for your strength. Give us clear minds and open our hearts so that we may witness you in our world. Remind us to be whom you would want us to be, regardless of what we're doing or who we're with. Hold us to you, Lord, and help us to build our relationship with you and with everyone else around us. Help us to be patient, God, to be loving and forgiving as you continuously remind us to do so. Father, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for falling short of your glory at times. Forgive us for trying to please and love this world instead of your word. Forgive us, Father God, for disregarding your love for us and instead chasing the intangible realities of this world. We ask you, Holy Father, in the daily round from sunrise to sunset, to remind us again of your holy presence hovering near us and your unconditional love. Free us from our shame and selfish desires and help us to see you in the moment-by-moment -moment possibilities to live honestly, to act courageously, and to speak from your wisdom. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen.
Our reading this morning is taken from Hebrews chapter 11 and it's verse 1, verse 39 and 40. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better, so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. May God bless to us the reading of his word. There seems always to be a delay between what is promised and what when we receive that promise. I know we are a long way from Christmas, but one of the, the things about Christmas that I found very frustrating as a child was um, feeling the anticipation of Christmas Day uh, and it was always palpable for me. And I think the reason for this is that when I was growing up and during the, the days leading up to Christmas, my family used to build the expectation from a long, long, long way away. We used to think, eat, sleep, dream, act Christmas. In fact, uh, I think I did that with my own children, so much so that, that uh, Rain and myself love Christmas music any time of the year. But Christmas has always been a time for our family of great celebration and love. A time when we gather together as a family and we celebrated the birth of our Saviour. We celebrated the, our family itself. We celebrated giving and receiving. We would begin this early uh, in probably in in the in the latter part of the year and um, we would begin it with one of the most underrated pleasures of life anticipation we would look forward to the day we would think about it we would plan it we would dream about it we would plan the meal the entertainment we always put on some sort of family concert we would plan our gifts we would express our wish list and I remember at times on the actual day that we children used to nearly go out of our mind waiting for our grandparents and our aunt and uncle to get to our home so that we could begin. We would only start the Christmas festivities when everybody arrived after church. The day was almost always a great pleasure and the fulfillment of our expectations and dreams. I was never really disappointed with Christmas. But I have to admit that there have been times and days in my life, unlike the, the, those days and unlike Christmas, where I've been hugely disappointed with the vast difference between the hope and the reality. We, we can all identify with the difference between the dream and the reality. And it's seldom in life where the hope is as great as the reality. It reminds me of Wagner's uh, opera Tristan and Isolde where the whole of the movement of the opera is a movement to fulfillment and one never quite reaches that fulfillment. Life is often a mixture of great expectations and yet also of great disappointments. The good things that we long for in life that drive us, that give us meaning are so often empty when we reach them. And in life, what is anticipated is never what we were told or what we expected it to be. That's why I'm so opposed to people who speak falsehood, like false prophets, people who breathe and speak false hope into the minds of people who are in such need of real hope. The substance of this kind of false hope is, of course, despair, which is basically a word which means the loss of hope. Kurt Vonnegut, the famous author, wrote a novel called Cat's Cradle. And he wrote something in it called, What can a thoughtful man hope for man, you, mankind on earth, given the experience of the past million years? The chief character is anxious to read this book, but when he does, he finds that it doesn't take long. The whole book consists of one word, 
nothing. So let me repeat that question, that title. What can a thoughtful man hope for mankind on earth, given the experience of the past million years? The whole book consists of one word, nothing. Now at times, breaking into our busy lives, we feel this despair and it becomes very heavy. There's a story of a man who was despairing of life and had climbed to the rails of a huge bridge and was about to leap to his death. When another man, a psychologist, seeing his plight, caught him by his collar and pulled him back. The would-be suicide side, sider protested. You don't understand how miserable I am and how hopeless my life is. Please let me jump. The kind-hearted psychologist reasoned with him and said, I'll make this proposition to you. Take five minutes and give your reasons why life is not worth living. And then I'll take five minutes and give my reasons why life is worth living, both for you and for me. If at the end of 10 minutes, you still feel like jumping from the bridge, I won't stop you. The man took his five minutes of despair and the psychologist took five minutes. And then they stood up, joined hands and jumped off the bridge together. This is a painful parable of today's culture of despair. In our text, which is written in the midst of our despair, the writer of the book of Hebrews speaks of something unusual in today's world, hope. And he speaks of those things that are unseen, those things that are, that are real but, and spiritual, but we cannot see them. He says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Now the hope he's speaking about is not just a naive optimism about the future. He's not saying that in the future things are going to get better or rosier and if we continue to hope in the future then things are definitely going to get better. But he speaks about evidence about certainty. Let's go back a little bit to see what the writer has been speaking about. The writer of Hebrews is writing to a church in a great crisis, to a church that is going through not only an identity crisis, but more importantly, a faith crisis. There had been people within the church who had become disillusioned, who turned away from Christ. And the writer has been at pains to make sure that the church gets perspective again so that hope is renewed and the spiritual crisis is averted yes even christians sometimes despair right from right from the outset the writer is intent on grounding the readers in the basis of the church the person of jesus and what jesus has brought to pass the book begins like this in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through him whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Beautiful writing. It's a beautiful book and just an unknown fact, you may not know this, but it contains some of the best Greek writing in the New Testament. The climax of the book is the truth that Jesus Christ is our High Priest who has entered into the Holy of Holies and has restored the relationship between God and humankind. In chapter 9, verse 11, when Christ came as High Priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, 
that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. And then I'm skipping to verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. So the writer of the book of Hebrews, who we think is either Barnabas or Apollos, tells the church and reminds the church that the possibility of a relationship with God exists. Forgiveness for the very real sins that we, we experience and take part in. He reminds us that communion with the Creator God exists, that meaning exists here and now, and that Jesus will come again to bring about salvation. Now I know that sometimes when we read these kind of ideas and promises, they seem really immense. And for many today who are used to a rational and scientific worldview, they seem either nonsensical or they seem like interesting perspectives on life from an old book. So I could either soften what he has said by telling you that he was really a man of his time who was trying to inspire hope to people and that we simply need to follow his example and try to give others hope. But by thinking that we would be missing his entire point, which is quite simple and profound to people like us who live in a disillusioned and broken world, a world where hope is almost a lost entity. His point is twofold. Firstly, the hope that God offers us in Jesus is a reality. No, Christ and Christianity is not a placebo. You all know what a placebo is. It's a pill that looks like a healing pill that appears from the outside to be something of substance. But in reality, it's, it's a false thing, a false pill. It's normally made of sugar. And the dictionary defines it as a medication prescribed more for the mental relief of the patient than for its actual effect on the disorder. Or it's also described as an inert or innocuous substance, usually used especially in control tests or thirdly, something tending to soothe. A number of years ago, researchers performed an experiment to see the effect hope has on those undergoing hardship. There were two sets of laboratory rats who were placed in separate tubs of water. The researchers left one set in the water and found that within an hour they had all drowned. The other rats were periodically lifted up out of the water and then returned. When that happened, the second set of rats swam for over 24 hours. Why? Not because they were given a rest, but because they suddenly had hope. It's a very cruel experiment. I understand. These animals somehow hoped that if they could stay afloat just a little longer, someone would reach down and rescue them. Now imagine if hope holds such power for rodents, how much greater would the effect be and should the effect be on our lives? Many people see religion as more, and more specifically Christianity as a placebo for the masses, which causes what is known as the placebo effect, where there's an improvement in the condition of a sick person that occurs because they're given a placebo. That Christianity is somehow a psychological mind game. Some people think Christianity is a hope pull. The problem with a placebo and even with a hope pull is that it is false. It is intended to deceive. And so it never really delivers what is promised. The writer of the book of Hebrews tells us that the hope that we read of and that is promised is not groundless. 
It's not simply an idea, a chimera, a fantasy, which promises the world and delivers nothing. But the writer is intent on telling us who are reading that there is a hope, a true hope, a real hope. Something that does not simply deliver false expectations, but reality. And he says very clearly that this hope is to be found in a relationship with God through Jesus. But the writer goes even further than that. He tells us that, tells us that this hope this reality which can give us meaning and sustain us in life can become real in the here and now. That we don't have to wait for the unveiling of things for it to touch our lives. Sometimes we think that we have to wait for, for heaven or eternal life. But eternal life is something we can receive now. We can receive that unseen hope right here and now in 2020. The second thing he tells us, he tells us how, he says, Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So he tells us simply that the hope promised by God and brought about by Jesus can be a reality today in our here and now through faith. Though we do not see it, we are certain of it. Though we hope for it, we are sure of it. The reason we can do this is because of Jesus. I worked with someone whose childhood at eight years of age was disturbed by divorce and who was used as a pawn by both parents who vied for attention, tried to use this little child as a weapon. The mother gained custody of the child and she used to go to her father on weekends. Her father used to promise her the world. He'd promise her weekends of great fun. He would promise picnics and surprises, but he never delivered on any of them. He promised to be at her concerts, but never arrived devastation and the scar of this remain to this day. There is a difference between naive optimism and faith. The difference is this. Faith is based on what God has said and does not disappoint. Whereas optimism simply is relying on chance and will often lead to disillusionment. The word of God today to those who are struggling without forgiveness, without a hope, is that hope does exist in Jesus and that hope can become a reality today. Jesus promised the same. He said, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus spoke about this hope as the kingdom of God. In the first words of his ministry, he said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Change your mind and believe in the good news. This is the tremendous paradox of the Christian faith. The kingdom, the rule of God, has come into the present and can be understood and experienced, can become a certainty for all who have faith, for all who believe. Christianity is based on faith. Simple faith, believing in Jesus. This faith though is not blind. It is grounded in a person, the very real and historical person of Jesus. But we cannot establish this by reaching or reach it by means of science or other human attempts. What is needed is faith, trust, we cannot have a relationship with someone based on some rational uh, standard or some rational criteria. Any relationship with a person is based on trust and faith. 
when I think about Christmas again and wonder what it was that gave me hope. I am very aware that it was not the presence or the food or the season, it was the presence of my family. I was able to trust in that love and because of that meaning flooded my world. Faith is misunderstood today because it is directed often towards things. We have faith that things will get better. We have faith that the finances are going to come right. We have faith that someone will be healed. The writer to the Hebrews tells us in beautiful words today that trusting faith is not faith in things. It is trusting, a trusting faith in a loving God. And the direction of that faith makes all the difference. If we long for things that do not arrive, we receive despair. But if we know a loving God by faith and trust, we walk with love and hope, even in hopeless situations. God is with us, even when we struggle. In the end, hope is nothing less than the presence of God in our lives, right here and now, through faith. Our faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Let us pray. Gracious God, fill us with hope. We place our faith in you, Lord Jesus, and we ask that you would bring us, continue to bring us meaning and purpose and the beauty of your hope, which is eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ, through all generations, for ever and ever. Amen.